I know what this place is. The timekeepers have built quite the circus. And I see the clowns are playing their parts to perfection. Big metaphor guy. I love it. Makes you sound super smart. I am smart. I know. Okay. Okay. Please sign to verify this is everything you've ever said. This is absurd. Sign this too. We protect the proper flow of time. You picked up the Tesseract breaking reality. I want you to help us fix it. Why me? I need your unique Loki perspective. Do I get a weapon? Nah. You really believe in this Loki variant? Luckily, he believes in himself enough for the both of us. Why? It is adorable that you think you could possibly manipulate me. I'm 10 steps ahead of you. You're not big on trust, are you? You can trust me. Loki, I've studied almost every moment of your entire life. You've literally stabbed people in the back like 50 times. I'd never do it again. Hi folks, welcome and thank you for tuning in to this very special live panel and Q&A brought to you by the female lead and Disney. My name is Bucky and I'm honoured to be joined today by the one and only Kate Heron, director of Marvel Studios Disney Plus series Loki. Known as the god of mischief, Loki steps out of his brother's shadow to embark on his own time-hopping adventure. The series came out on the 9th of June and we're a few episodes in now so there is plenty to talk about. If you're watching, make sure to get involved with the conversation using the hashtag Loki. First up, we're going to start our panel with a few questions from Vanessa. Take it away, Vanessa. Thank you so much. So my first question is, what was it like working with the one and only Tom Hiddleston? Is he mischievous in real life as well? So working with Tom was a delight. He is lovely and he was an executive producer on this project. So, you know, we worked very closely with him on the story and obviously he loves Loki like we do. So, yeah, I think it was just really important for us that, you know, if we're going to go back in with this character, that we'd have a good reason and just that we all kind of were telling the same story. I mean, I think you've done it brilliantly, like already, and we've only like gone, we're, we're only a few episodes in and I think everybody is loving it um, already. Um, I really enjoyed the action sequences. So what was it like directing all the fight scenes? It was really fun for me because like my back, uh, my background basically is in comedy. So like I've done, I think like on some of like very minor, like I remember in sex education, we had one of our actors falling off a tower, <laughs> which is probably like the biggest stunt I've ever filmed. Um, so no, it was really fun. I had um, an amazing stunt coordinator called Monique Ganderton. And so we worked very closely together on it. And I think for me, I, I approached it with story with my director of photography, Autumn. For both of us, I was always like, okay, well, let's make each action sequence feel very different, you know, and they're always emotionally driven. So like from what people have seen, for example, like, um, Okay, so like uh, the Ren Farron episode two, we wanted that to be kind of fun, um, but also a bit like kind of like a predator taking people out with like, you know, how Sasha was enchanted her character and then seeing this variant in the shadows. Whereas like when it's at Rock's cart, the stakes are, you know, very high at this point and it's not so fun. And we wanted it to feel a bit more gritty and more dark. So we did have a bit more of like a handheld kind of feel with the action there. And just also in terms of how we covered the action when Loki's fighting you know, the enchanted. So 
yeah so I think it was it was basically always for me like thinking about the scene emotionally and then talking to Monique about that and also about like the fighting styles of the characters because you know they're all different characters with different backgrounds so like Loki grew up in a palace so you know the way he fights is actually quite balletic and it's quite um slick and stylish in some ways whereas like some of our other characters uh they didn't have a life like that so they fight a bit more like rough like you know so I think it was kind of fun like working out how do all these different characters fight and how we approach each fight scene in that way as well that's so interesting to hear because like their fighting technique kind of changes based on their backstory almost which tells you a lot about the character um as well um, my next question is where did the inspiration for Miss Minutes come from because <laughs> I already love the character already. She's not even the main character. <laughs> yeah, so Michael, that's definitely Michael Waldron. So basically he's from the South in America. And I think like it was his way of infusing some of his own sensibilities into a character. And I think the reason she came about in terms of story as well is that we always, you know, I remember in the script, it compared her to Mr. D DNA in Jurassic Park. And I was like, oh, I get that. We can totally do that. And of course, because what she's doing in the first episode is so much tied into the world building. It is one of those scenes that we ended up having to rewrite so many times, like right up to, to be honest, when we gave the first episode in, because we had to make sure in terms of the MCU, like what we're saying in that story made sense to the audience because it kind of sets up the TVA, the rules. And then as everyone's been discussing, you know, like, oh, what does this mean for the next phase? So that's definitely something I think in terms of her involvement in episode one. But then she was just such a fun character. I think it's just, you know, like we were like, oh, me and the writers were like, well, let's just see wherever we can get her in. And, you know, in the second episode, we see her doing those hilarious training videos with Loki, which I think is so much fun. And she originally actually in the first episode did come out of the screen, but we really, it was just too crazy. <laughs> so we, I think I was like, okay, well, let's keep her in the information cartoon in episode one, because that feels structurally a bit better. And then in the second episode, we'll introduce, oh no, she is like a real living cartoon. So it was kind of, and which makes sense, I think, because in episode two, you know, we're peeling back the onion more as we show more of the TVA and a bit more of the characters that are there as well. So yeah, but no, it was very fun creating her and getting to film this like Roger Rabbit style animation as a director, because I, I don't know many jobs where you'd even get to do that. And for anyone interested, how we did that essentially is that we had this sort of terrifying lamp on wheels that we'd stuck eyes to, and that was our real Miss Minutes. <laughs> and so um, Eric um, in our props department, he puppeteered her for like Tom. So the actors were always acting off someone. And then we had a brilliant on-set reader as well who would do her voice. So yeah, so it was definitely like a big learning curve for me because obviously when I took this job, I hadn't filmed like an animated character before. So it was quite fun just learning how to do that well as well, so. I mean, it sounds amazing, obviously the process of everything. And when you think about it, it's like, how did you actually film it? And how does, <laughs> how do you have to act that out as well? Um, and I definitely think all the interactions with Loki um, and her character are really fun and just add something really special to the show um, as well. Um, my last question is, Loki talks a lot about being burdened with glorious purpose. So my question is, what is your, your glorious purpose, either in film or in your personal life? Oh, so I'm trying to think, what is my glorious purpose? <laughs> I'm trying to oh, think. <laughs> I, I, I love storytelling. I've always liked making my friends laugh. I think that's probably what got me into storytelling. Like I used to write short stories that were kind of silly to make my friends laugh. And I suppose that's kind of weirdly what I'm always going towards is like, how can we get the joke in? How can we do this? Um, but yeah, I suppose like hopefully to tell stories, <laughs> hopefully at the mercy of the audience, but hopefully it's to do that. I re I've always really enjoyed storytelling and yeah, and I love how collaborative film is as well. Like I did a lot of theatre when I was younger and I really like, you know, the sense of being part of like a group of people coming together to make something. So yeah, I suppose something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vanessa. Those questions were fantastic. Um, now it's my turn um, and I have, I have a list of questions. I'm probably not going to get through all of them, but I'm going to give it a good shot. Um, part of these are coming from me as a Loki fan, as a Marvel fan. Um, I just want to say you've done an amazing job so far. So thank you. <laughs> thank um, you. First up, I would love to know a little bit about how you became a director and the sort mm. of route in that you took and, and what led you to directing Loki. 
Yeah, so I think sort of what I was saying to Vanessa that, you know, I I did a lot of drama club and theater and stuff when I was younger and I go to like my friend's house and be like, let's put on a play. And <laughs> like, I think I thought I wanted to be an actor, but it's honestly, cause I just didn't really, I mean, I like performing, but I just didn't really understand like what a director did. I, I didn't really know. And I knew I liked writing stories. And I just, I think, cause basically in sixth form, I had really good teachers and I took film cause I was like gonna go to drama school. And I was like, oh, well, I should probably know more about film. And like basically my film studies teachers, cause I, I'd seen like Lord of the Rings, like I've lost count of how many times I'd seen that film by this point and loads of other movies that I was really obsessed with, but I hadn't really thought about film in like a, a you know, film theory kind of sense. And I remember they kind of opened up my mind and they were like, there's this director you should check out, you know, Kurosawa. Uh, we did Scottish cinema and I hadn't seen train spotting that really inspired me. But anyway, they kind of, I think really opened up my mind to the idea that you could make a film and, you know, have authorship in it. And I just was like, oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know you could do that because I felt like I could kind of take, you know, I love working with actors. I love writing and I love like kind of putting something together. So I was like, oh, this feels almost like all these random skills I've got. <laughs> I can kind of bring them all together into this one job and obviously a lot more things. So yes, yeah, so that's kind of what began it for me. And then I made like a few short films on my friend's dad had this like camcorder where me and my friends would make like sketches. So I just made some like short films and then I applied for film school when I went to university. And that really is what taught me, you know, like what a director of photography does, what a first AD does, sorry, a first assistant director. And just how all those roles that you see on the credits at the end of a film, like who those people are. And I think that was a chance for me to learn that and also just experiment and be like, okay, so what kind of filmmaker am I? And probably quickly learn, oh, I'm not so good at this, but this I'm quite good at. Um, this is definitely not the kind of film I should make. <laughs> um, but that was kind of fun to kind of, you know, make mistakes, I guess, in that sense. And then, uh, so it's a long story. <laughs> and then I graduated. Um, and basically after I graduated, I remember being like, oh great, I'm gonna go just work in like Hollywood or the film industry now. And obviously that didn't happen. And I I was a temp for a very long time and I was a waitress. Um, I've worked in quite a lot of places to be honest. And But what I did do alongside working in those places and just, you know, keeping myself afloat was that every year I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna make a short film on whatever I have and I'll borrow a camera and a few of my friends were studying at uni still, so they would rent equipment from the uni. Um, but also just, yeah, I'll just try and make some stuff and I'll make it with what I have. So I, I'd always come up with a list of like, you know, like my parents, you know, their house, for example, because I lived with them when I came back from uni. So I was like, okay, well, they're away this weekend. So with the weekend they're away, I could make a short film <laughs> um, and I'll set it in the living room because I know I have a living room here. So it was just stuff like that really. And just as I made more short films, um, they got into more festivals and then, you know, I got into different talent schemes and just met people. I think every job I've got in this industry like I got sex ed because the, 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 basically the director of photography on that is like the head of the camera department. He'd filmed a sketch, a uh, short film with me that I'd done and he just remembered me and he recommended me to the director, you know, the lead director on that. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of what got my foot in the door. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Would you say there's a couple of directors that were like major influences on you or just favorites? Definitely. Um, trying to think so probably out the gate like Spielberg right because I loved Jurassic Park and like Jaws is like my favorite movie I just love it and I think the reason I love Jaws is like I was obsessed with it when I was younger because it terrified me and then when I got into film I sort of found this new appreciation of it like how he used the camera and how he told certain moments I just felt like I learned so much from like so many people he's a master right so I learned so much from watching him but then it was so funny because obviously in film studies we looked at Kurosawa and like Spielberg definitely was inspired by Kurosawa you can see there's like crossover with their style so like I I think that definitely those two and like I suppose like everyone every filmmaker I definitely was obsessed with Wes Anderson <laughs> when I started making films I was like this guy's so cool and but I don't know really I I don't have like one particular filmmaker to be honest I just love film and I watch quite widely like I'll watch everything like from, you know, like art house to like the latest Disney animation. I just like story. So yeah. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> I having obviously watched Loki so far, I was really intrigued by 
the sort of 1970s vibe that the TVA had. Um, and for those that don't know, the TVA is the Time Variance Authority who kind of oversee uh, the, the timelines in the Marvel Universe and check that everything's kept in order how it should be. Um, but yeah, it had this like really strong sort of 70s vibe, which I'm just obsessed with, I think it's amazing. I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit on the kind of decisions behind that. Yeah, so with the TVA, they're outside of space um, and time. So it's a place that's really, they're not in the past and they're not in the future, which I thought was so exciting because I was like, how do we show that? And I felt the really obvious route in a way would be to make it look, you know, super duper futuristic. And I feel like we've seen that with a lot of bureaucracies already in like, you know, like Men in Black. And I just kind of was like, I love that film, but I was like, but this should be different because it's new. So I, I think for me, I was initially inspired by the comic books because they had these amazing images of like basically it's like rows of desks stretching off into infinity so that's definitely something that me and my production designer like brought to the look of the TVA but I think in terms of like the architecture like we'd spoke about this kind of Blade Runner and Mad Men kind of like mixture with Marvel and Michael the writer and I just was like well where I grew up in London, there's a lot of brutalist architecture and they filmed like a clockwork orange near where I live and children and men. And I just thought, oh, it'd be really interesting, I think, to take that brutalist kind of look, which is very grand and godly, which for me felt like the timekeepers who are basically like these sort of uh, godlike deities that like oversee the TVA and mixing that with the Midwest kind of architecture, because that does tip into the Mad Men style, but also it's very heroic and very classy in the TVA, you know, they're protecting time. So I think that was kind of my jumping off point was gathering lots of images for that. And then also just having a bit of fun with like my own, as I mentioned, my own experience as an office temp, <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> posters in offices telling you to keep your desk tidy. And I was like, okay, well, what's the, you know, the TVA equivalent of that. And Kazra, my production designer had a lot of fun. He created all these amazing posters for us across the TVA, which I think really helped sell that office culture. And something else was that we really wanted to feel like this living, breathing space and like, I love doing long takes and me and my DP uh, Autumn, we were like, and with Kazra, we kind of designed a lot, you know, of our sequences, knowing that Kazra could build these really big practical sets for us. Cause like, for example, in the first episode, oh, and I should say, so when I say practical, I mean that it was a real, like it was all there. It wasn't in the world of visual effects necessarily. It was obviously enhanced and made look awesome by visual effects in a lot of places. Um, but it just meant our actors and me like, we could walk across these sets and I think it really helps ground it in a sense of reality, which obviously for a place that's very surreal, um, I think was really necessary in helping it feel like, I don't know, just yeah, grounded. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, did. that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd for that sort of stuff. So that was like, that hit every point for me. And it was like, even down to the infinity stones being like paperweights, it was taking this like phenomenal cosmic power Oh, it's, we're using those paperweights. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was awesome. <laughs> I remember reading that and being like, "What? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? What do you mean? Like playing with my heart?" Yeah. But yeah, I think it was fun for me as well because, like, I, I think that's what was fun about it was because we had those rug pull moments, right? Like with the Infinity Stones, but also like the weaponry, for example, like the time sticks. Like I had like old, I think, police batons, and I think the collar that Loki wears. I found this like. I think it was like a dog training collar or tracking collar. And I I, I sent that to uh, Russell Bobbitt who creates all the props. And, and he was like, oh, this is great. And then he obviously like added lots of other stuff to it. But I think it was really fun. I like the idea that the technology the TVA had, again, didn't look super futuristic because it almost puts you a bit on the back foot, right? Because then like Loki, when you're going into this place, you're like, are these guys really as powerful as they seem? And then obviously, you see them take out that other prisoner very quickly and efficiently. He, you know, gets pruned. And I think for me, that was exciting. Like, and, and just also leaning into that office culture as well. Like I remember the computers I worked on when I was a secretary, like they definitely needed updating, like they were old. And I thought, well, we've seen stuff like that in sci-fi, right? Like with Brazil, with the retro futuristic technology and golden age of comic, uh, sorry, comic books as well. So I just was like, oh, we should have this retro futuristic tech in the TVA too because I just think it's quite fun that everything kind of works but you know it seems like it probably does need a bit of an update <laughs> yeah yeah exactly there's like a clunkiness to it that I really thought was cool mm -hmm. uh, and I think the internet in general was very grateful for the for the collar for a multitude of reasons <laughs> um, <laughs> um 
you mentioned obviously taking some inspiration from the comics and stuff and obviously the the marvel fandom being a part of it explores so many different ideas and concepts and all this sort of thing through fan art and fan fiction and and all that sort of stuff do you look at any of that or do you try and go in kind of completely fresh with your interpretation of it i think generally like i mean i've read uh comics obviously that loki's been in so definitely was inspired <laughs> by his character um but no i i would say generally like i think i've seen more to be honest like kind of fan imagery i, I probably not fiction no one's just because i haven't been tagged in it to be honest but like <laughs> but, but people share stuff with me on instagram and i share it because i think that's cool i like seeing cosplay and people's illustrations but no i think definitely there's a sense that I mean, I love the character and like, I've definitely like followed his character and like, you know, seen what people like about it. And, you know, for example, like I wanted to show more of Loki's magic. I know that's something that a lot of the fans were really keen to see. So there were definitely things like that, that I had in the back of my mind, definitely. Um, but I think it's just that balance, right? Is that you want to uh, tell the right story, but also, yeah. I mean, it's fun to put things in there that, you know, people have been waiting for, so. Yeah, and it, it, it comes across that you care about the character as well. Like it's it's coming from somebody mm. who has cared about that character story arc, which I think I think it really comes across and it comes across mm. as very authentic, which I think is probably why people are enjoying it so much. Um, the other thing, of course, that Marvel fans love is Easter eggs. Mm -hmm. And I know you can't talk to any specific ones because that would defeat the object. But do you get to play with ideas for those or are they something mm. that kind of come down from on high? No, like, honestly, they come from like everywhere. But like, I would say like, I mean, basically, just everyone working on these shows, right, and all my team, we're all quite nerdy. So like, generally, it's like best idea wins. I mean, for example, I can talk about this one. So like episode two, um, in like the, uh, the, we call them the TVA archives, it's like the library that Loki does work in, I thought it'd be fun to hide some comic book numbers, like in the background like in relation to people can dig out what they'll be <laughs> i don't want to give it away but like but we did in quite a few places little things like that so sandra the visual effects supervisor for that scene like she was like oh maybe it could be this comic or this comic so it's not really i think it's more always like a discussion really and marvel pitching stuff but honestly i think it's just you know everyone loves the comics and the stories and it's like you know best idea wins really but no i definitely hid a few in places and this isn't really an Easter egg, but I, I tried to put in like visual homage. Oh God, I'm gonna say it properly. <laughs> homages, homages. <laughs> I put in visual homages to uh, uh, different Marvel movies across the show, which obviously Iron Man in the desert is one that people have noticed. Um, I think people spotted the one in uh, Rock's cart as well when Loki's on the floor. So I've tried to like put little things like that in as well. But yeah, but I generally, sometimes I'll point out what the references are but like you said I generally think as a fan like I love finding those easter eggs because I think it's so exciting when you it's like a little secret that you get to keep for yourself so yeah but no it was a lot of fun kind of sprinkling those in for sure amazing um I've got another a, a pretty well I'd say heavy question I think it should be a question that probably everybody should talk on a little bit but women only make up around 20 percent of key behind the scenes jobs in top grossing films and tv so as a female director did you feel that you faced challenges while breaking into the industry oh like yeah <laughs> for sure like I think one thing I would I'll start off with a positive okay so one thing I would say is like you know I'm part of a female directing collective called Cine Sisters um there are lots of us and there, and it's been so exciting because I, I think i've been in that group now for maybe four years or five years but over that time alone i've seen so many of my friends like get these amazing jobs and i do feel like with more content that's needed like i am seeing so many like brilliant women like breaking through now which is really exciting and i know that i am definitely uh lucky in terms of the jumps i've got to do in my career because i know it's unusual for a, a woman to have done that i really hope it won't be uh, one day that made me very happy <laughs> if people were just like oh cool like you know this other person did that um but I think something on Loki that made me so happy because it, it was the first time I got to other than my short films obviously like hire my heads of department and our crew was like 50 50 so I'm really proud of that <laughs> um yeah but we had like a really good gender split down all of the department heads in Loki um but in terms of challenges yeah I mean it's a funny one because I've been trying, I guess I was trying to get into the industry 
for a long time. But I don't want to dishearten people because this was like five years ago or four years ago now. But I've yeah, I've been asked like stupid questions and yeah, and for sure have I think the main thing, less of a stupid question, but more I think it was all it was never like coming from a conscious place of looking at me differently, right? Because I'm a female director, but I just don't know any male directors that are asked this. But I'd always be asked, like, are you ready? Or are you sure? And like it's just for me a bit of a bugbear. <laughs> and I'm always like, I'm ready, man. I'm ready. But you know, but I, I think I hope that will change. And I and like I said, I think as more women are breaking through and being in like these high end jobs, I think it is, you know, it won't be a question anymore. So yeah, so I think definitely I've, if anyone feels like apprehensive or like, oh God, am I gonna have to? Yeah, I mean, everyone, it's like life, right? Even if you're like, I don't know, out for a walk, probably you're gonna meet some people with some, cause it's the world <laughs> with like differing opinions to your own. But I, but I would say I feel quite hopeful for the future. Cause even just in terms of like, people that are hiring, you know, like women, they want to hire women because we make, you know, good stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good tagline. Women, we make good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so not eloquent. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm really no, I like, <laughs> so like, everyone's like, how does women make the show? <laughs> no, that was, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have some questions from our audience now. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, there's there's some good ones here um first off I, I would say this is simple i know for me it takes some thinking but who is your favorite mcu character loki <laughs> I, i'm not even just saying that to be like ah, 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 it's loki but generally like i love loki like i went hard for this job because when i i basically found out they're making a show about him and i was like i just need to know what's going on because like you know i thought he was dead and now he's alive, which is great, but like, what, what's their plan? <laughs> so I know, so he's definitely my favorite. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, he's such a complex character. There's so much to dig into. I, I suppose I've always, I mean, I've said this in a few things, so sorry if it's repetitious, but like, I love um, villains. I think you don't necessarily have to like their actions, but you have to understand them. And I just think Tom's performance and the writers, how they've written Loki and the directors is like, I think it's just a masterclass in empathy and grounding that character. Like, you know, cause when he was making some of his decisions, I'd be like, oh no, don't do that. And then obviously this amazing journey from villain to anti-hero over the last decade. So no, I just, I think he, he hadn't had much screen time and I thought, well, you know, wow, this is great. He's going to get a whole TV show. So I'd, I'd love a chance to dig into that character more. So yeah, so Loki is my answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of villains too, so I'm, I'm there with you. <laughs> um, which part of the show are you most proud of? Oh, that's so hard. Like, do you know what, actually? It, it sounds a bit cheesy, but I think honestly, the fact that my team and that we just pulled this off in the circumstances because it was already going to be like a really big challenge to like make something you know making these shows like because you know we have like marvel wanted these to you know look and have the scale of all their movies but we were making them how you make it in the sense of like a like a tv show in the sense that you know it was six hours of content we did film it like a big movie in the sense that you know it wasn't made in the showrunner system they were running it how they would on a marvel film but it still comes with its challenges in making a six hour thing <laughs> that way so i think that was a challenge anyway but then obviously when we got shut down because of covid it added another layer to that and i i think like I've been so grateful to have a job during this time. And I think me and all the team felt the same. We knew we were very lucky to be working and getting to do something. So we kind of threw our hearts and souls into it even more so I think. And I think also just the fact that, you know, like post, for example, like I finished the show yesterday. Uh, I've generally been in Atlanta living on my own finishing the show, but we really did it over Zoom and over video chat and like, you know, it's been definitely a really interesting way to work. And I'm just very grateful for people because, you know, there's a lot going on for people outside of work this year because of where the world is. So I suppose that's what I'm most proud of is my team. <laughs> like, yeah. As you should be, I think that's, yeah. that's, I think anybody who's done anything more than even getting out of bed in the past year is, is fantastic. So everything you've achieved is, is magnificent, I think. Um, 
Have you got a favourite prop from the Loki series? I have actually. <laughs> I can't tell you guys what it is. Um, so there's a, there's a prop in episode four that I did a terrible drawing of and that our props like Russell turned into this beautiful thing. I'll have to find my drawing when the episode comes out because the drawing is so bad, but it was like, <laughs> we should do this. And he like took that terrible drawing. This is why he's the genius. And he turned it into this beautiful thing. But I would say the a prop you've all seen, um, I love the temp pad. Like um, I'm very proud of that because I, um, in my pitch, basically, I found like this old computer, like, I, I don't know what era it was from, maybe the fifties or I, I don't know, but the buttons were really old. I had all these like images of like old buttons that I was really interested in. And, but Russell was really excited by it. And he was like, oh, like, and he did like kind of, he took inspiration from those buttons. And then we kind of built, yeah, like this idea for the tempad together. And I'm, I, I think the tempad's my favorite. I just think what he designed is so slick and so beautiful and, yeah, so that's probably my my favourite, I guess, in what I'm allowed to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's plenty of secrets that we can't talk about yet. Um, what did you find, if any, did you have kind of a, a biggest thing you learned while working on Loki? Honestly, just like, I think it always goes back to team again, because like I, when I pitched for the show, I knew I was pitching something stylistically that was quite different to what Marvel had done before. Um, I remember hearing like, I think it was Brian Cranston. He was talking about when he goes up for acting roles and he kind of had this mentality of he was like, well, I'm gonna give my best version of this role. And if they don't want me, then that's no big deal. I just wasn't the right person for this job. And I think I started, to, I took that mindset partly probably for sanity reasons. Cause I go like interview for stuff or I'd have a pit, uh, like a script I'd pitch and they'd be like, oh, that project's not for us or whatever. And I think for me, I was like, okay, well, whenever I pitch on something, I'm gonna just give my full vision of it to 100% and if it's not for them then that's fine because I haven't like tried to guesswork what they're after I'm sort of giving them what you know they would get if they hire me so I think for me that's something I learned because it worked to my you know I got the job on this <laughs> like I was like I'm not going to try and guess what Marvel want to make for this I'm just going to be like this is what I think we should do with this you know the story and the look and everything so I think that for me was like a big thing and also just your team at everything like it, it sounds like, I mean, I knew it from other jobs I'd done, but it was so key to me. Like when I was hiring the heads of department, like Kazra, for example, my production designer, like we had stills from my pitch and his pitch that were the same. And these weren't like just, you know, stills you can find quite easily. It just showed already that we were already on the same page. And I think for me, that was really key. Like an autumn, my DP, I hadn't worked with her before. And same thing like she was talking about like because I wanted to shoot it like a film noir and like we both share so much about lighting that we love and she talks about lighting as a character in a way that I really related to and I think for me that was really important was just finding my people I guess and I hope that's something I hope I get to work with all of them again but I yeah hope on every project I can do now I think that's really key is just make sure you're all on the same page and telling the same story from day one because making something is really hard. So, you know, it will be hard and you will disagree with these people that, you know, you respect and love. So it's probably better to do it with people that, you know, creatively you're aligned with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you think having a female director kind of changes the lens that people are seeing these characters through? Do you think that brings a different sort of experience to it? Oh, it's such a funny one, right? Because I, I guess probably like, if I was looking at the work, like if I wasn't so in it, maybe I'd be like, oh, this is what she brought to it. But I suppose I'm not really thinking of like my gender when I'm <laughs> approaching stuff. So like, I don't really think about it in that way, but um, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure that there's certain things that, you know, I'm sure as we see more directors, maybe we'll see correlations across how we shoot stuff. But I don't know, I brought myself <laughs> so I suppose, and I am she, so I, I guess. <laughs> there is seen, going to be some aspects of that I guess but I don't know <laughs> yeah I've seen some interesting stuff with people saying sort of like uh I, whether it's intentional or not just uh kind of looking at it through a, a female lens like in the way that male characters are shot and all of this sort of stuff mm -hmm. there's some quite interesting sort of discourse around it so I think you're right I think it's something that you would look back on and be like oh actually mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe it's this yeah. um, 
So that brings us to the end of the audience questions. Um, a huge thank you to everybody who sent those in. That was, a, I think, a pretty good range of questions there. Um, and now we have a very special video from the stars of the show. Gugu Mbata Raw and Wami Masaku. Hi, I'm Arabella. Hi, Arabella. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. Okay, so I'm going to jump straight into the questions. Um, so it's great to see multiple prominent, powerful characters played by women of colour in the show. How important is representation to you, and especially when it comes to big shows like Luke? Well, I think it's just necessary um, in this day and age, you know, I think it just needs to happen. And I think that's the cool thing about Loki and uh, about Renslayer being a judge. You know, she's a powerful woman. She's respected. She's in a position of authority and she's worked her way up. And, um, you know, so many powerful women of color on the show, including Romy Mitsaku and Sasha Lane and and behind the camera as well. Um, in, in Kate Heron, our director who directed all all six episodes um, of the show so um so yeah it's really her vision um behind the scenes um which has has brought the show to life so speaking of women the series is about time travel if you could go back and have dinner with any woman from history who would it be oh my gosh any woman from history that's that's major. I mean, there's so many. I would love to have dinner with Cleopatra. I think she would be um, an interesting dinner guest. I'd be curious to know what we would eat um, in <laughs> Egypt. Um, again, Queen Elizabeth I, I think would be fascinating. All the queens, basically. I think it would, yeah. be, <laughs> would be fun. Um, the warrior women, Judica would be another one. I think another great woman from history to have have dinner with. Um, yeah, I think I'd just want to, to get some tips from all the queens and all the women. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I would probably do the same as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice That's all the questions done. Hi, it's Safiya. I'm um, from the female lead. Hi. The series is all about time travel. If you could go back in time and have dinner with any woman from history, who would it be? Any woman from history? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Ooh. It's a good one, that, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Oh, I would go back to, I would, I would want to meet Queen Asantiwa. Um, yes, I just, I just think she, I mean, as to talk about strong wo woman who can hold her own and lead an army, like, I mean, yeah. Queen I love that. Yeah. Um, so as a boxer, I have to train for hours every week, like a few sessions a day, uh, so a couple of hours a day. What is it like preparing for this the fight season? <laughs> fight season. Um, so I love boxing. I used to box like oh, four times a week. Yeah, yeah I love it. I love that. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. I actually really enjoyed doing the training and um, just because it was something that I have never like I've never experienced explored my physical strength in a, a, a role before and um you know i'm not i've never actually had a fight <laughs> which is oh. <laughs> um, oh. probably good for me because <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm not a great boxer but i am strong and i Save can that pretty face <laughs> <laughs> what about yours <laughs> it's all right <laughs> it's gone now anyway <laughs> Um, I've got one more question. The series also explores the concept of the multiverse or where different like version of characters exist. If you could play any other character from the Marvel Universe, who would you be? Oh, that's a big question. Um, putting you on spot today, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I think I think, so, I think I would I would want to I would think I would want to play Killmonger and um, just to sit in his body for a bit because that's okay. quite yeah because he's kind of you know it's quite like I don't know he just got all that swag like hey auntie I just kind of love that and um, swag oh. and that, yeah that bravery I like that oh I love that um <laughs> but yeah that's that's it for today um, thank you thank you see you later nice to meet you and you take care
Those were great questions. Um, we've sadly come to the end of our panel now. Um, a huge thank you to Kate and Vanessa for joining us today. And we hope that everybody enjoys the series. You can catch up on Disney Plus now uh, with new episodes dropping every Wednesday. Keep an eye on our page for more Loki themed updates over the next week. And don't forget to let us know what you think of the series. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch you out there in the timeline soon. Bye. Bye, thank you.